join Mary Kennedy to warm up for the big game. Up for the match Saturday at 9.20 on RTE1. Relax and enjoy a slice of family life Simpson style on two. Or join us for a leisurely stroll nationwide here on one at seven o'clock. There's no time for relaxation now as the build-up for this weekend's All-Ireland Finals begin in Breaking Ball. This week on Breaking Ball, with Hurling's major day about to dawn, we talk to the minor protagonists. On All-Ireland Weekend, we meet the man at the back of the backdoor challenge. And five unknown celebrity seekers plus two nervous chickens bring you a derivative preview of the big match. It was a weekend when a few prospectors turned Croke Park into their personal El Dorado. Using discrete intermediaries, Break and Ball has established that certain people are interested in being considered for the following awards. Oh, put your palms again. Tyrone find out again that six points isn't enough in the bank when Mayo were in town. Cora Staunton is captured on video ransacking the Ulster champions. With Kerry's All-Ireland hopes fast heading south, in steps Michael Francis Russell to restore a sense of direction. Camogie's first Cork Tipperary All Ireland goes all wrong for Cork from the start. Deirdre Hughes fuels the tip getaway. With respect to the visiting horses, the Kilkenny town of Goran has been put on the map by its hurlers. On All-Ireland Weekend, Breaking Ball looks at the origins of a remarkable generation. DJ Carey, Pat O'Neill and Charlie Carter arrived in our school in 1974 as very young fellas and they were full of enthusiasm from day one. They would have played hurling on school teams from the age of 10 onwards and they were um, very talented young boys. Right from the very beginning we had high hopes for those three lads. They would all stand out in their own little ways. Um, Charlie began as a reluctant goalkeeper, I suppose. We'll always remember that for Charlie. He was very, very skillful, so we believed in putting a good goalkeeper in on our team for starters, and Charlie ended up in goal for starters, reluctantly at times, but he did a very, very good job for us. DJ was extremely small, and um, people always were dumbfounded at the skills he showed on the pitch, and he earned himself the nickname the Dodger from his ability to get around bigger opponents all the time. Pat was um, bigger and stronger, and Pat was the defender of the three of them. The other two boys were forwards. But Pat always um, was very dominant, either high or low on the ground. And he was a very wristy hurler, which we like to take pride in in Kilkenny as well. He his wrists do the work. For a big chap, no matter how near the ball was to his feet or anything like that, he could clear a ball left or right. So each of the three of them had their own characteristics and their own style and their own abilities. We were very lucky that those three players were born in the one area. Also, we were very lucky with the school teachers we had here, John Knox and Dick O'Neill, who were excellent, you know. They had a great love of hurling all the time and promoted hurling in the school and did a lot for it. Those three fellas, they all went to school in Cairns and that further to develop their career, they picked up the skills, they won medals with Cairns and their confidence grew a lot, which we, we gained a lot by their experiences in Cairns. There's one famous story in the school, I suppose, was myself and Pat O'Neill would have been known to like 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 the grub, I suppose, a little bit more than others, and uh, we were known to be bullies, I suppose, taking sandwiches out of lockers. And DJ's DJ's locker was actually one of those better places where you get a sandwich, uh, especially after the Sunday dinner. So we were known to be taking his sandwiches on a Monday, but uh, it was going on for a couple of weeks, a couple of Mondays, and one particular Monday, then we we got to the locker and opened, and the locker got the sandwiches. But um, when we went to taste the sandwiches, they were uh, full with pseudo cream. So it's the last time we got to DJ's locker. So. We learned to our, to our mistake what DJ's like. As everyone knows to their detriment, he's a, a lethal attacker, a lethal 
finisher so he's a mean streak as everyone will knows and more so than this year he's got very important goals for Kenny this year so he's, he's far from innocent man. See me and Julio down by the schoolyard See me and Julio down by the schoolyard we knew a little bit about them from Goran Primary School and the Kilkenny Primary School's hurling leagues. And when we did get them in here in the first couple of weeks, DJ size told a little bit against him. I'm wondering with this little lad, and also Charlie was quite small. We had no fear of Nailer, as we used to call him, because we knew he was big enough and bold enough to take care of himself. As far as Pat was concerned, his physical strength was a great asset, but for a big man, he was also very skillful and very fast hands. And he actually made the college senior team in his second year. I'd say as far as DJ was concerned, it was his acceleration and his anticipation that he was able to see things quickly, far quicker than other players. And as for Charlie, it was his skill. His first touch was excellent. Eighty-three, when we all arrived in, we all played underage, under 14, juvenile, and we won the Leinster final that year, but with all four of us on the one team. But in 88, the three of us, Pat O'Neill, DJ and myself, three of us won an All-Ireland Colleges in 88, and went on to win a minor All-Ireland with the Kenny the same year, so we have good memories from here. In the minor final of 1988, like, um, what, what people refer to as the Gordon goal, was won by um, Pat O'Neill in the half-back line. He fielded the ball, drove the ball directly up towards DJ Carey who won the ball solo through several players passed the ball to Charlie Carter who was playing uh, full forward and scored a goal like that was the highlight from there on regards the inter-county scene going around the map it was the hand of God really that gave us those three such talented fellows in the one area in such a short space of time it means everything to our children here they're so proud of the three boys having done so much for Kilkenny they would all love to be the future DJ or Charlie or Pat. Not that the lads are finished yet, might I add, but they're all hoping that one day they will emulate the feats of those three boys. Two months after the capitulation in the Leinster final, Offaly revisit Kilkenny at Croke Park. Goalkeeper Stephen Byrne secures the scene. Kenny this year, I've been impressed with all their forwards, um, especially their full forward line. They're lads with experience, they're around a long time, and even though the likes of Henry Shefflin, who is young, he still has, has great experience in the Kenny team, you know? This is the second time to meet now in the, in the All-Ireland final in three years. I suppose a lot of people, in their own point of view, will be saying that awfully dumb put in as much effort in a Leicester final but it, it, that's very untrue uh, we go to, we went out to win that game Kenny played very well on the day uh, when they got the lead it, you know they held on to it held on to it well I suppose at inter-county level the game that sticks out in my mind is probably the 98 game in Torless against Clare well, apart from myself things went really well around the field we played as a team everyone got stuck in um, we got through that and got through the final then with the same um, cuts and determination you know just moments ago here the saves on that day really you know everything fell right you know there, there, there's other days when, when things don't, don't don't work out for you but it's it's special I suppose at, at a level like that to be making saves um, again you're only as good as your last game I started playing goals at a young age I think it was around 9 or 10 um, at the time I, I wasn't particularly too pushed in going in um, I suppose around the time when, when Jim Troy was playing in the goals and they said, well, here's another redhead, let's, let's put him in and see how he gets on. Baker. Now, I feel that courage in a goalkeeper is very important. Um, when you have a man coming in and, and, and you can see a lot of goalkeepers around the country throwing themselves, like, that's hard done. You have to make up your mind uh, to go and do it, either to stay put, wait for them to come, or just get out of them and, and, and try and block, you know? Even in training now, even apart from matches, I mean, if someone is to sneak a goal in, um, I don't be too impressed. Um, but these things happen and you have to put up with them. If someone picks up a paper um, and uh, hasn't been at a game and to see a lot of goals going in, the goalkeeper will be blamed straight away. Now, the goalkeeper could have had a great game, but it doesn't work that way, you know? People are putting the blame on the goalkeeper because he's there to do a job, he's there to stop goals. Um, even if it's not his fault, he's going to get the blame. If a goalkeeper is to blame, you know, he should stand up and say he's to blame. Um, of course, a lot, a lot of us don't do that. We, we, we tend to blame probably a back. But, yeah, I, I feel that, that probably they have the right to say, yeah, you, you were to blame for that, and, and you know. But it's, it's about doing something about it the next day, you know. You have to get it right in the head and get mentally right and make sure it doesn't happen again. You have to start focusing on the game very early. Um, it's, it's no good in focusing on the morning of a match. Um, it's an all Ireland final now. It, it's the biggest game 
on, on the calendar so like you'll be focusing uh, a good few weeks in hand like you know getting everything right and getting mentally prepared as well to me uh, the first ball in the game is, is very very important for them to build confidence in the goalkeeper um, if you can get that and, and you can strike a ball long or get it out get out of the danger area um, that, 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 that's where it counts I think every player visualises what's going to happen in a game. It mightn't happen, everyone knows that. It's the bounce of a ball on the day. You do be thinking, from a goalkeeper's point of view, you do be thinking, you know, puck out. You're, you're going to get a puck out in the game. Um, you're thinking about where you're going to put it, what you're going to do with it. You know, I mean, you're looking at the, the likes of a forward coming in. What's he going to do? Where's he going to go with it, you know? Every defeat hurts. I suppose, again, people will say that we didn't put in enough effort in the Leicester finals. As that's very untrue. We wanted to win them games badly. Um, we have another chance at it now. We'll do our best to try and win it. It's nomination time in the breaking ball house. All year our all-seeing pundits have scrutinised every second of action in the championship and now it has to come down to two final contestants. Who will be next to face eviction? This is Big Brother. Could Kane Murphy of the Star please come to the diary room? How are you doing Big Brother? I've spent a lot of time with these two over the last year. I've come to know them really, really well. Awfully, well, they've been the jokes of the pack and they've taken great delight in making fools out of the rest of us, especially when we least expect it. We all thought that they'd grown out of it, but clearly they've shown this year they've had more than a couple of tricks still left up their sleeve. This Kilkenny side, however, they're the most experienced of the final contestants. Because of that, they make more convincing company in final week. My vote for eviction goes to Offaly. <laughs> This is Big Brother. Could the Irish Times' Sean Moran please come to the diary room? It's not that I don't have a soft spot for Offaly. I know people give out about them, but uh, at the end of the day, they do what they have to do, and they don't always get the credit for that. It's just that it would be so hard in Kilkenny you know, to be put out for three years running. To kill them, and I don't really have the heart to do that. Anyway, Offaly haven't been quite as much fun as they were in recent years with Martin Hanamy and Hubert Rigney gone and John Troy a bit out of sorts. So it's not just a question of feeling sorry for Kilkenny. I actually think that they deserve this, and I think that they're going to win it. This is Big Brother. Could Sunday Independence Dermot Crow please come to the diary room? Hello, Big Brother. Uh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to nominate Offaly for eviction. Because although they've been good fun, it seems like they've been around the place for ages, 20 years or so. Uh, Kilkenny, they're that bit more reliable I guess, they clean up, they wash the place uh, from top to bottom whereas when the big jobs are to be done early in the year around springtime awfully seem to go missing um, so because of their unpredictability, the fact that they can just swing from one move to the next from one day to the next, I'm afraid I'm going to have to nominate them for eviction so Kilkenny to stay, awfully to go and besides, I like a few cats around the house <coughs> Back in the house, an attempt at vote rigging has been caught by the cameras. This is Big Brother. Could Philip Lanigan of the Irish Sun please come to the diary room? Hello, Big Brother. Ever since they've come into the house, Offaly have been flirting with disaster. They haven't pulled their weight around the house. All they seem content to do is play it up for the cameras. Meanwhile, Kilkenny have been left with all the usual chores when it comes to Leinster honours. But at least you have the younger lads like Henry Sheffield and Dennis Byrne leading the way and taking on that bit of extra responsibility. 
So overall, I have to nominate Offaly for eviction. This is Big Brother. Could the Evening Herald's Frank Roach please come to the diary room? Hi, Big Brother. I'd like to nominate Offaly for eviction. The trouble is, they never knock on the hall door. They're always slinking in the back way. Whereas with Kilkenny, what you see is what you get. They've been totally upfront about it this year, and they always put their best foot forward, be it DJ, Charlie, Henry, or whoever. So we reckon Offaly should shut the back door on the way out. Kilkenny to take the prize. <laughs> So there you have it, two teams, one winner. Only Sunday will decide. The most successful minor counties of recent years meet in Sunday's final. As Cork and Galway target another All-Ireland, Breaking Ball gets the inside view. Well, we knew D Dublin were going to be good when you look at what they'd done this year. They'd come out of Leinster. They were after beating every team in Leinster already. And they'd beaten Offaly in a round robin, but lost to them in the Leinster final. So we knew that they were going to be good. <laughs> Saying that, we didn't play well in the first half, I feel. And uh, when we came out in the second half, we seemed to be a different team and we seemed to settle down well. Um, Crow Park was a new experience to us and it took us a while to settle it. But um, once we settled down, we seemed to play well and we seemed to get down to our own game. We were very slow to get into the game against Offaly, so we were, because I don't know what was the reason. Maybe it was the first time that we played up in Crow Park which, as a unit, so it was. And I suppose the Hogan stand not being there wouldn't have been much of a help. And uh, I suppose it was more nerves than that, and that's one of the reasons why we didn't get into it. But uh, once we got into it, we started hurling well, so we didn't. And we were in at half time with it as a draw match, and then into the second half, we got goals. And within a few minutes to go, we were only one pint up. and we pulled away, which is a good thing at the end of the day. What we do know about Galway is that they're a good, fiery team. They like to run with the ball, and that, um, that if they need a, an extra point to win, that they will go looking for that point that they won't give up. They're very committed to the cause, and they're all out to win uh, an all earn for Galway. But we know what we know about Galway is that they're out there to try and take away our all Ireland medals. But we've been training for too long to leave them do that. I've seen them hurling in the All Ireland semi final and they were very good. They were playing a very good Dublin side. They possibly could have won a Leinster title, so they could have. And Cork, Cork sort of just pushed them aside in the last 15 minutes, so they didn't. Just, that showed good character and showed determination and fitness and all that come through. There's no significance in the fact that the Cork have only ever lost to Galway once in All Ireland hurling final. Saying that, um, we will go into this match confident. We have three good, solid victories behind us. But um, we're going to take nothing for granted on the day because we know Galway are an exceptionally good team and after all, they are all Ireland champions going into this game. Beating Cork now would be, it'd be nice to beat them in an All-Ireland minor final especially, but beating Tipperary last year it was special because they've always been Galway's enemies to heaven. Do you know, there's always rivalry there between Galway and Tipperary because we're only over the border like in... Uh, I think beating Tip last year it was, it was very nice now beating them, so it was especially being underdogs. To win this All Ireland for Cork would mean a lot. It would show that the, there's still youth in Cork curling and that uh, it might augur all well for a future in Cork curling, hopefully, anyway. I haven't been thinking about the speech. Um, I have a friend, alright, and his father's a teacher, and he does the speech for me, and he'll probably do it again on the day. I might as well give him a plug. Frank Lenhin, he does all the speeches for me when I need him. Uh, so he'll be doing that for me. No, it's not putting much pressure on us having not won a All Ireland underage back to back. But it would be very nice to do it, you know. And whether we can do it, it'll be, we'll be, we'll see in a few days. But we have the potential to do it, and it's going to come down to a great game. So it is, and it's, it's going to be the team that wants it most and the team that can score. for the start of the game. Referee Mick Spain looking at his watch. The Arcane Band marching off the field. There was a great atmosphere built up. 
between Kilkenny and Cork and it's sort of on a beautiful summer's day or sunny day uh, where we're going to further that chapter in history. They come and bring the ball down into his hand, the shot it at the goal! Cork went ahead and then we sort of got close to him again. They scored two great goals, I think, as far as I remember. Uh, a lot of nice points, but we kept plugging away with the points. Yeah, I think there's only about two points in it at half time, and a, a very entertaining first half. Eddie Shotters and Eddie Care points his third of the game. They went about four or five points up and we could see a gap opening because uh, they were really putting our backs to the pin of their collar. Because I felt that we needed to come back at that stage. Out in the middle of the field, I saw Dennis Collin getting a ball, running and going to hit, hit the ball towards the point and Frank Cummins got into Hookham. And out of the breaking ball, if I may use the phrase, um, Chunky O'Brien came in and swiped up the ball and sent a lovely low ball to me and I took it into my hand and turned and um, solo down the left wing and I decided to hit a slice ball in towards the goal and hoping that Paddy Barry wouldn't be able to hold it and that the forwards would get it and bu bundle it into the net. Paddy put his hurl up and I think the sun was probably in his eyes as well. Almost straight away. Ray Cummins got loose, got through and got a great goal, a hand pass goal. And almost immediately after, I think it was Mick Malone got another goal. And then Con Roach, who had a fantastic game at wing back, ran onto a ball and hit a huge ball, 80 yards I'd say, over the bar. And now there were eight points up. With the cheer of the Cork crowd, I suddenly felt that Cork were starting to relax, you know, that they had it now, but they didn't realise there was still 20 minutes to go. There was really plenty of time for Kilkenny if we could get back. Five goals and 11 points for Cork, one goal and 15 for Kilkenny. That point that Con Roach got, strangely enough, was the last score that Cork got. Every score came after that was from Kilkenny. And this is Eddie Kerr. And that was Kieran Purcell. Obviously, all the forwards felt we needed a goal, and Kieran Purcell made a drive at the goal, and he was pulled down on the 21. Kieran working his way through. He's on the 21, the 14, he's fouled, and there's a free in for Kilkenny. I didn't want to signal to go through my usual routine of taking a free that I was going for a goal, and Mick Spain, who was a referee, came around, and he placed the ball on the 21. Now, I started fiddling with my sock, I think, uh, to let the let him get out of the way and let everyone get out of the way and then I walked back towards our goal and turned sort of quickly and I saw that there was a bit of relaxation in the Cork goal so I ran quickly and jab lifted it and went for the goal and it went in. I think that brought us to five points down and then we started moving again. Then Frank Cummins got a ball around the middle of the field and sent a pile driver to Paddy Barry's right, which was a super goal. We were now on the roll. We eventually ran out winners by about seven points, which was an extraordinary turnaround from being eight down. And he sends it over the bar. I always say that 72 was the best final game of hurling that I played in. A great game, played tremendously by both sides. It could have gone anyway, but we got the run at the right time. On a very hot day, it was a magnificent feeling. Next week on Break and Ball, we go south of the border down Limerick Way. Putting the cool in culinary, Tom Durley gives an epicure's view of Croke Park. And we'll be recalling one of all Ireland hurling's great saves. All that and much, much more on Breaking Ball next Friday at the later time of 11.35.